us. As you know, we met earlier this morning and had a shift for folks who uh, that was a more convenient time. And um, I know that people will be coming in and some of you may have to leave for, you know, to meet other kids and other commitments. But I wanted to thank you for being here and at least let you know that um, the school modernization committee members are here, of which there are also subcommittee members. So I'd like to introduce you to Rich Gossenberg, who is actually the chair of the School Modernization Committee subcommittee on teacher input. And so that would turn out fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are a subcommittee of the town council, so we have a couple of things we have to do that are reportable. So uh, if you would take the roll, please. Yes. Ms. Kemp is not here, Ms. Bates is here, and Mr. Gussenberg, yeah. and we have a foreman of the committee, and Mr. Orris is also present. Okay, Mr. and I don't see a flag. Oh, there is a flag. Right. We're supposed to stop the flag, so. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 So, let me first of all thank you very much for coming in. You can grab a seat wherever you can. We were in the other room over there earlier this morning. So, let me, let me give you a quick overview uh, of what we're all about. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the Town Council and the uh, Board of Education uh, got together uh, last spring. Uh, and said we need to move the question, the issue of modernizing our schools forward. And the way to do that would be to come together with a joint committee uh, consisting of some board members, some town council members, and um, some community members. So a school modernization committee was created by the town council. Uh, it has a, a very aggressive timeline, uh, and that is a Ask that we attempt to put together a plan uh, that would come to the town council in early September with the hope that they could then move uh, to begin the process at the November uh, elections. Um, that's at a very aggressive timeline. I don't know if they need that or not. But the committee has been meeting on a regular basis uh, a couple times every month. Uh, there are three subcommittees that have been set up. This is one of them. Uh, We're going around to all of the schools, meeting with any interested staff members. Uh, we've done Doolittle, Huddleston, uh, Dodd. We were at the high school this morning and had a big group of people. We're back again, and we're scheduled to meet with all the other schools. There's a second subcommittee that's going out and looking at uh, new and renovated schools around the state of Connecticut uh, to compare with what we have. And there's a third subcommittee which is looking at bringing in an outside consultant to work with the committee as we go through and look at pricing and all of the other issues that, that come up with all of this. Um, so Jen is on, on the committee. Uh, Rob Morris, uh, as our uh, mayor, is uh, uh, ex officio on every committee and it's been uh, coming, uh, coming out also. Uh, to hear some of your comments and input. And um, we are here basically in a very informal way, informal setting, for you to share with us uh, the things that are working here at Cheshire High in terms of the facility and things that maybe aren't working. Um, and specifically, we've been looking at uh, 21st century learning as you're moving ahead. What are the program needs that you have? And are those program needs ones that can be met within this facility? Uh, or are they things that we would need to do additions, renovations, or a new building in order to meet the needs of the instructional program? So we start off by saying thank you for everything you've done. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, people look and say, well, we don't need new facilities because you guys are doing a great job. Kids are learning at very, very high levels. Uh, but we know in some cases that despite the facility, not because of the facility. Uh, with that said, let me just open it up to you and uh, feel free. Uh, I would like you, if you would, uh, when you're called on to state your name and whatever department uh, you work with, we are taking minutes. Uh, those minutes are sent out to all of the members of the committee so everybody sees a detailed uh, description of everything we're doing. 
We're also videotaping all of the sessions. Hope that doesn't make you nervous. <laughs> um, but we do want committee members and hopefully community members to uh, to uh, take a look at these and get an inside view uh, of what's going on. Um, I did chuckle a little bit. I kind of went on the community forum one day last week. There was a gentleman who woke up in the middle of the night, didn't sleep, so he watched a video of the school modernization. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say that that put him right to sleep. <laughs> but it is there, as there's at least one person I know who's taken a look at it. So with that said, uh, hey, Mitch, can I just for a second, if you don't mind, my apologies. I don't want to take up much of your time, but I want to personally thank you on behalf of the council uh, to be here today. Uh, it's critically important that you all have input in this process. Uh, my three kids have gone through this school system, and I couldn't be happier. Uh, they have all been very successful, big part because of all that you do every day in the classroom for these kids. So. Um, I want you to understand you are all very important to us, and I don't want you to think that the town council makes decisions with taxpayer money in spite of the school system. Um, it's important that you all know that we have a big balancing act every day uh, to balance, you know, making sure our senior citizens and those on fixed incomes can remain in this community. Uh, but a big part of this is making sure that we have quality schools, and we do have them, again, greatly because of all of you. Obviously, physical plant is part of that, and we understand we have very aging facilities and we need to fix that problem. How we do that in a cost-effective manner is really the tough issue. Um, and, but I think if we all do it together, we're all bellied up to the table together, we can get it done, and we can get it done that's in the best interest of everybody. And that's really the mandate of this town council and the board of ed, is to make sure we do this in a collaborative, cooperative manner, uh, put politics aside, put all the crap that we see nationally going on every day, uh, all this stuff you see on Facebook, people personally attacking each other, that's ridiculous. I'm sick of it. We're all good people. We all care about our kids. We all care about our community. We can work together to fix this. And so I want you to know how important it is to me, as council chairman and mayor of this town, to work this out in a collaborative manner that's fiscally responsible for this town. And we wouldn't be sitting here with you today if it wasn't important to us. So I just want you to know that. The reason we're recording it is really for transparency and so that everyone can watch it and say, wow, we didn't realize what was going on in these schools. Part of this plan is making sure we can take it to the people, let them understand what they're voting on. And if you know who I am, I really care about transparency, making sure that everybody knows what's going on. That's why that camera is here. It's not because we're trying to catch somebody on what they say. I can tell you right now, I don't care what you say in this room, it stays in this room as far as I'm concerned, other than people watching and saying, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that school was in that shape. Or wow, maybe that school is in much better shape than I thought. I don't know what it's going to be, but the fact of the matter is we care about what you have to say, and there should be no filters here. Um, so the only thing I always ask is respect to everybody, and I know that's going to be the case. So thank you for hearing me out, and I appreciate your time today. Okay. Mm -hmm. With that said, I open it up. Yes? Uh, Don DeMeo, English Department. Um, Can you spell your best name, please? DeMeo, D-E, capital M, E-O. I apologize after I <coughs> so I'm just going to have to go to rehearsal. But I wanted to. So that, that being said, um, today I have two thoughts. And one is that I am, like, from pretty much from December through April here in the building until 9 o'clock at night. And it fascinates me, like, how this building is used by so many different groups. And between, like, 2.30 and 9, not only do we have like other teachers and like different athletics happening like all over the building, but truly um, other groups coming in from outside in the community and there's literally no regulation of like who necessarily is in the building. There's no security here at night. So if I'm down um, on the stage with, you know, 60 kids, there's like, I don't, what would happen? I mean, I mean like I would hope nothing would happen, but there's like no, like who would I call? There's like the security that we have during the day, we, we don't have at night. And um, a lot of our doors don't lock, the doors to the auditorium don't lock, repeated work orders are open, but like literally the staff here is like scrambling to get so many things fixed that they're, you know, like sometimes things fall to the end. But the idea that those, that inconsistency with security um, in the physical plant in the building, but just a recognition of how many people are in this building on a daily basis. And along with that, because this is sort of a central community center, there's a lot of times where outside groups come in and use our facilities, but there's no one to regulate that all of the equipment or the status of the rooms or the space goes back to some sort of norm. 
So even if we did modernize certain things or like bring things up and like put in new equipment, there's no regulation of that. There's no person. We need to like also think ahead to like if we do anything that there need to be people whose job it is to say, let's like how do you put the state back to like a, a you know a status quo? Like what needs to be in order? Who pays for things when things are broken? Because a lot of times outside groups come in and then when we go to do a production the lights are broken and it's like we just have to pay for it or, or you know we'll have to buy those things and that comes out of like our budgets and so that becomes tricky when we're sharing the space with a lot of different people yeah. well, let me ask you you music. oversee the, the drama program i'm not the only person i do i direct the musical okay we did talk a little bit this morning about the stage about the facilities if you could take just a minute and kind of tell us a little bit about you know uh how appropriate uh, the, the facilities are there for the, the drama productions? Well, I mean, the stage is a good size. Uh, I think that the I think that the equipment is super out of date. I mean, our, our board is 20 years old for our lighting board. Um, our sound board doesn't lock anymore. There's study halls that are right there. During productions, we have rented equipment, and we have that equipment up during the week, and literally the only security we have for it is a, is a sheet that we throw over it, and we, we frequently find that like city hall students um, are like there or like lean on things, and like whatever we might have set, we, we have to like reset. And if Mr. Salamini's not around, who knows what would happen? Because like the number of times that we have to call him and say we don't know what's going on, but the board doesn't work, or nothing turns on because somebody pressed something, or moved something, or touched something. But we've got no way to do that, and we can look back at the cameras and see who did it. Um, as far as the, the physical space, because the because the auditorium is not regulated, the seats are all often broken, there are seats missing, um, we've had to relabel the seats just for ourselves because we sell tickets online for our for the musical production, so Taryn has gone in and done that herself. Um, it, you know, I think we work well with each other, like when somebody else needs the space, usually they'll email one of us and say, I need to get in there for a meeting, can we get in there? And we, like, we work to accommodate that the same way that I think we you know, the athletics does with the gymnasiums um, when they need to be used, but we're all using that same space. We're lucky, we're really lucky that we have a program that does like work to build our sets. The CTE department is amazing and they work really well with us and it's the most practical thing that the kids like not only learn those skills of construction, but build something that is going to be used by their classmates and they get to be on the ground floor of designing the set as well as building the set. And it's a really like wonderful experience for them. So I'm glad that they're there, and that you know it would be nicer to have that classroom closer to the stage, so they could build closer, or to have a back door. Like, could we redesign the theater? Absolutely. I mean, if it was on a wish list, we would sit down and like I think we could talk about it. There's not an adequate classroom for Taryn to have her class. It would be good to have a black box classroom for her to teach her classes in, um, along with having the stage. Like, there's no way to really make that space. Um, like multifunctional the way that it's designed right now. Thank you. So those last few things you said is kind of what I'm looking for. Um, I hear your issues, but what ideas do you have to, if you were to build a new school, what would you do to solve those issues? Well, I, I mean, I think that like even if, I, if, we, if we created a wish list of what could be in the theater, I think the biggest thing is we literally need to hire one person who's in charge of monitoring and managing, managing that space. And I know that's a personnel issue and not, mm -hmm. but it, like if, if it would mean it would mean nothing if we didn't do that. Like someone needs to be there who can who can deal with the lighting and the sound and like you know know who's coming in and like you know make sure that like everything is brought back and kept in order, mm -hmm. um, and an agreement with like who's responsible for paying for what things. Like that just needs to get laid out, I think. I but but I think the black box theater would be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If I can step up in space, because I'm sorry what she's mentioning. <laughs> um, an example would be, for example, I used to work at Hamden High, and they did a major remodel at their school where they built a new theater as part of the remodel. And one of the things they did was behind the stage space, they built a black box classroom that was the same size area as the stage, so we could rehearse in that space and we'd you know, tape it off so the stage would be available for building and other purposes while the rehearsals are still going on. And then when they built the shop for the stage, they actually built a, um, like a garage lift up wall 
behind the stage so they could build in there and then lift up the wall and roll the set out onto stage so it didn't have to stay on there as much because they had a big enough shop that they could store some of the stuff in. So that gave more availability to the use of the stage because things didn't have to live on it for the three months or whatever until the show was ready to go. And then it also gave a classroom space that was big enough to both have desks and rehearse because my problem right now is I teach both English and theater and so I have my theater classroom, but it's too small to have any desks in because I need the space for the kids to move. So when I have to teach English, I have to go up and take an empty classroom to teach English in because my class isn't conducive to it. And then my class is actually even too small for the rehearsal usage, so my kids, when they rehearse, are out in the hallways of my area getting in the way of everybody else and making noise because theater kids are not quiet. Um, but with like eight different groups rehearsing in my classroom, they can't all be in that space because no one would hear anything. Um, and then I've, in other schools I've taught in, I've had the, the theater as my classroom. So I have the places spread out and I do it, but the theater is so used because study halls are in there during the day. They need it to build the set on the stage. So when I first started teaching here 16 years ago, I would try to have my class in there and I gave up within a year because it just wasn't feasible. Mm -hmm. Taryn Chorney. What is it? Taryn Chorney, T-A-R-Y-N-C-H-O-R-N-E-Y. Thank you. Yes. yes. Hi, my name is Margarita Vélez. Pia and Victor, E L E C, and and the World Language Department. I teach Spanish. So this is uh, my 16th year here at the high school. I have been for all this time in a classroom with no windows. Um, the ventilation obviously is poor sometimes because there are problems with the heat and uh, to regulate the heat, there is nothing I can do because I cannot open any windows or, or close any if it's really cold. Sometimes I have to put my coat on to continue uh, classes at the end of the day. Sometimes I am very hot during the day. Around uh, when the buses are coming around 1.50, sometimes I get very dizzy because the fumes from the buses coming to the classroom, not just me, our kids do too. Um, for the place where my classroom is located, it's right in front of the, it's like in a corner, so there is a lot of traffic in that corner. So I I cannot even, sometimes I have to close the door because I cannot even leave the door open because of noise. Um, about four years after I was teaching here, uh, I was very, very sick with a lot of uh, sinus infections. I mean, I reported this to the, to the nurse. It was like unbelievable. I will come here and get sick again and again and again. Um, we ended up closing my classroom and then I ended up in a car. Sometimes I would give classes in the commons, in the cafeteria, upstairs. I was in this car because I didn't want to go back there. So they say that they were going to fix, that the problem was coming from the tunnels front of the school because there was a lot of water into the corner, into the tunnels. There was, uh, and I would bring, I was basically breathing, having like a facial with all that thing that was from, from, the, from the day, basically, because there's no windows or anything. So they fixed the problem, so I feel a little bit more honest about my health, and I did get a little better. Um, this problem wasn't just with me, but I'm just talking about me personally because I cannot speak to anybody else. Um, I wish I could take it to my classroom and show you because there's, uh, you know, it's different to talk about it than when you're there. Obviously, the lighting is not that good. It's all, uh, you know, artificial lighting all day long uh, because of the lack of windows. There is no, if there is a fire on the school or, you know, God forbid, there is just the door and then there is a little window that uh, next to a door that uh, was built about, I don't know, I want to say 10 years ago. So there is that little window and, and the door, but there is no another exit to leave in case there is a, a fire. If there is a, some kind of lockdown, the door doesn't, um, it opens with a little knife. There is no way to really, we lock it down during the uh, lockdown, uh, how it close? Lockdown. Yeah, close. Lockdowns, yeah. Yeah. Close. Lockdown. yeah, yeah, yeah. Lockdown. So they come and they go, but they really do not try to open it. If you really want to open it, you can open it. it or it's not safe. 
So I love my job. I love what I do. I think I do it well. But honestly, I intend to stay here for another 10 or 15 years, and I worry a lot about my health because it has been a long time um, being in, this, in that condition. Um, and it's not too, you know, good thing I'm not like claustrophobic or I'm not depressed because it's really hard to be without any, you know, for so many hours a day. So, thank you. Yep. Uh, just one comment, the uh, full committee did come through about a week and a half ago uh, in a night meeting and uh, your principal walked them to the building, they got to take a look around, it's not the same as you know, being here while the students are here, anything like that, but mm -hmm. they have walked the, the facility, and we're doing at, that at each of the facilities, taking a look at the furniture, the lighting, the size of the rooms, all of that sort of thing. But they also really wanted us to get direct feedback from, from you, which is why we're doing this also. Yes? Hi, I'm Michelle Coaches. The last name is K-O-C-H-I-S-S. -S. I'm in the English department. And I have two concerns. So just briefly, there you know there's heating issues within the building. Um, it's like a little joke where we look at the temperature in the morning when I come in. Empty classroom with no students, 80 degrees every morning this week. So we, we open the windows, which is great. I got a lot of fresh air. Um, but we have students leaving because it gets cold because they're sitting by the window and they want to close the windows. Um, Mr. Tartarelli, I saw him, he came into my period seven class. Kids are sweating when we close the windows, and yeah, they're teenagers. We'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have students that sometimes get sleepy, falling asleep because it's so hot, and then have to leave, go get clothes because it gets too cold. You know, we've been dealing with it for years. The other concern really was at the end of the day today, knowing I was going to be coming here, and I really appreciate you all taking the time to come and, and listen to us, you know, express some of what our experiences are. So I was at a PPT, and one thing, you know, educate, the face of education has changed, and I'm so proud of the level of support that we give our struggling students here in the building. And because we support our students so much, we have lots of PPTs, 504 meetings, and having the space to conduct these meetings is really important because here we have parents coming in, sometimes we have advocates coming in, visitors to the building, and I sat at a PPT today that was, it was the, not the conference room in the special ed department. So you've got a table around this size and you have a group of people sitting around talking about the, the education of somebody's child. And oftentimes there's not even enough place to sit around the table when you have the school psychologist in there, the regular ed teacher, special ed teacher. So having adequate conference rooms that are actually conference rooms and not converted offices. How many conference rooms are there in the building? Oh, that's a good question. Two? No. Four. Yeah, there, there, are two, there, there, are, there are three good size ones. One up in got well, two up in Gothic, like two, three down the main office, one in special, and so forth. Okay. They're good size. <coughs> they're smaller rooms that are to be purposed. Pretty all booked all the time. All the time. Yeah. Yes. And if I could just ask, what, what size generally would you all like to see in, in more meeting rooms like this? Ah, some math you know, person would say. Yeah, well, what, what, <laughs> what I'm trying to get to is, you know, even. Uh, the Spanish class, all your different classrooms, what is ideal for you to properly teach in terms of sizes? Are your class sizes generally okay, but the HVAC is horrible? We understand there's a lot of issues with the buildings, but it, we really want to make sure when we're looking at alternatives from maybe renovation versus new construction where not every building is going to be brand new overnight, so there may be some renovation requirements. What can we work with in terms of the physical structure that works? Fixing all these other things that we know you're dealing with. So sizes, collaborative space, mm -hmm. locationally where certain things ought to be oriented so that you can collaborate properly with various aspects of what you're teaching, all that kind of stuff. How we segregate all the community that's using parts of the building at certain hours so that they don't impact and have access to for public safety reasons, other areas. Those are the kinds of things that I'd love to hear more of if you guys have that. So. Does somebody else want to speak to that? Donna Carbone, English. Um, I, I would like a bigger classroom because 
My students do a lot on the computer. How big is yours now? Yeah. It's, well, I don't know. It's the room right They're across small. the hall. I have no idea. They're small. Um, They're so, I have, so I have 20, I have 24 students. And my desks are kind of pushed, you know, to the walls. And when everybody's on a laptop like that, it's I can't walk around to see what they're doing. So is it fair to say, just generally throughout the building, that all the classrooms yeah. are smaller yes. than they yes. should yes. be? Yes. 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 If you have a classroom, there are yeah. teachers in the building who don't, who don't, don't have, have a classroom. I think one of the things that was talked about this morning is the fact that in 1950, when this building was built, you walked in and you had lines of kids who sat and stared up at the front while the teacher right. taught. Mm -hmm. Now you've got kids grouped in, in various ways. You're conferencing with a group in the back. So that 650, 700 square foot room that you may have found adequate in 1950 is now impossible. You can't move the furniture around and stuff to, to meet the needs. Because the one thing we are dealing with with reimbursement is the state will only allow you to go to certain sizes. And if you want to go beyond that, then it's not reimbursable. So obviously they've done some research as to what is ideal for certain classroom sizes. But, you know, so we, we really want to get as much of that information we can. So as we're designing and redesigning, we can be helpful to you all. Basically, as big as we can build it is what you want. Right. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like it. I, I don't, I don't think those. Is that what we heard yesterday? Yeah. Is it ours? Ours are some four and a third of that. Because it's really like 20-something. Yes. Um, just to go along the size, I have, oh, Holly, S-K-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-R-Z-Y-
yeah. located in a similar area? Are you all over the building? So two are in the World Language Hallway, and then two are in the history. But I've been all over the building. I've been down here. I've been over there. You're I'm in English. over there. Um, so yeah, it, you know, you just travel with the kids. You just like, yeah. look both ways and try and get to your next class. Um, but it is not effective teaching method. Uh, I definitely lose time in the beginning of class and the end of class because I know I have to pack up and I have to go and get ready for my next class in a different room or a different area of the building. So I do lose time at both the beginning and the ending of uh, the period. And even like just simple things that you don't realize take so much time just to log on to the computer. And you're just like, yeah, yeah. You know, you're waiting for everything to load. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and another thing, we have 15, 15 people in our department between here and um, Dodd, and then we have an elementary uh, teacher who comes up and works with us sometimes here. And our office is from the electrical box over that way for mm -hmm. all of us to mm -hmm. share. And that's where we our eat. department head has his office. That's where we eat. That's where we store all our books. And go back uh, to the there, too. Yeah, and, and we have a bathroom in there, too. Yeah, it's really yeah. fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> We're, very, We're very close. We're very close. Um, <laughs> but, the, you know, getting stuff done, it's uh, it's it's a lot. We sit on top of each other. We, we, sh we collaborate a lot. Yeah. Mostly Does each that. department yeah. have, have an office area? Oh, no, no, not really an office area. Okay, just a little world language no, has one small I, area. If I may speak to that, uh, my name is Arturo Branco, first name A R T U R, last name Branco B R A N C O. Um, I think some departments have their office. Uh, luckily, sometimes that department office, it is a, a department office. Um, I don't know exactly how many only have an office for themselves. In our case, our office is uh, is as a magistra Obrowski was saying is a office, a work a work area, a lunch room, storage room, storage room and conference room, and it really there is. We actually moved on to a closet now yes. because the space is so limited. Yeah. So. We, have a table. we don't have space, for example, to have uh, uh, conversations that require confidentiality. We don't have that. We have to many times go into the hallways to do that. Uh, we don't have space to, uh, for example, uh, the two teachers to my right and many of other teachers in our department don't have an area um, close to the department where they can sit with students and tutor them. Uh, and give them extra help in the other areas. <laughs> Sometimes they do sit in the hallway, or they have to come all the way to the library to do so. Um, so space is at a premium, without a doubt. Um, so in our case, it's really uh, not conducive for the instruction. There's a lot of instructional time that is lost by moving from one place to another. And aside from that, these, when we're talking about spaces, the spaces that we <coughs> And some of them are so tight. We have some uh, some classrooms in our department, and I know that other departments have classrooms just as like uh, as the one that we have. That the space is so tight, you cannot move around in the classroom. The you yeah, can't get between the rows because if you do, you're bound to touch a student in a very uncomfortable way, and it's not conducive, and we, we need mobility. We need to, you know, we talk about personalization and in, in, individualized instruction. Some of these classrooms are not conducive to that. It's impossible to do that, you know? So I'm not gonna risk, and many of our, my, my colleagues are not gonna risk moving around, and we don't know how th what things may be taken uh, or understood, understood, but it's not conducive. So space is at a premium here. I am. Um, Thank you. <coughs> Yes. Hi, um, Mary Nell Lent, L E N T. That was an easy one. Nice and Um I teach science. Um, I've been here for almost 20 years. When I first started, I taught in room 85, which um, I do this in now. Um, it was a wonderful space to teach science. It was nice and big. I had sinks. I could put the stream tables up. There was plenty of space to move. Um, I have since moved to one of the um, rooms that was built in 72. It is tight. There are cabinets that are glass that come off the rails if you're not careful. The cabinets that where stuff is stored in the room are also glass. It's great to look in it. 
but with NGSS and um, the new standards, this style of teaching is no longer you know, up in front of the room lecturing. It's a lot of, uh, I don't want to just say hands-on, but it is modeling collaborative work and then showing your work. Um, one of the things is we, um, you know, you brainstorm and you have, you know, a flip chart and you're doing this and the kids are doing their own things. But my room, again, space is the theme here. Um, there's not enough room for the students with their backpacks <coughs> and the tables and the chairs and the counters. Um, I mean, I'm a little person. I'm able to get around um, the room fine, but the students have trouble getting around in a comfortable way. Mm -hmm. um, true story, today, the uh, room was a little hot. Uh, one of my AP environmental students went to open the window and go, oh, Miss Lynn, I think I broke your window. <laughs> and he had the crane on my, oh no, that's the way it is at all the time. The windows do not, I mean, I have to physically get up on the counters and open the windows and physically get up there to close them. None of the cranks work. The caulk looks like it is not in good shape. Sometimes the black comes off on my hands. Um, I don't know what is in that black caulk that is, you know, could be some things in there that um, would be of concern. Um, it, it, the drawers sometimes fall apart, so there's a lot of safety concerns that I have within my room um, because it is becoming old and it is needing repair. So those kind of things. But space, uh, again, the way we're teaching or not, as you said, it was built when there was more lecture in front of the classroom. And that is not, you still do some of that, but not to the same extent. And again, if you wanted to, again, I love room 85, the space that was in there, the counters, the way they were. You could do flexible grouping, move the tables. Um, it was just a really great room to teach science in. Okay. Yes. So David Kadugan, I'm also a science teacher. C-A-D-U-G-A-N. Um, I teach chemistry, um, but I know I have taught biology in the past, and I see the biology teachers um, and the space that they have is completely inadequate. And every time I see their kids like tripping over backpacks mm -hmm. while they're carrying, um, you know, maybe an acid <coughs> or something, which um, like my heart just like breaks because I know there's going to be accidents because the amount of space they have to do what they need to do is just completely inadequate. Um, I feel like the chemistry labs actually are large enough. Um, the main problem with them is their share among teachers. Um, and the teachers I work with are great about scheduling that, but there's a lot of times when the, the instruction that goes with the lab would be best if it happened first, because the students would get more out of it if the sequence was the optimum. But because of sharing, it's, you know, if another teacher is using the lab, well then the sequence is not gonna be optimal. Do you have a regular students. class that you teach in and a lab space? Yes, yeah, so I have a regular classroom and a lab space for chemistry labs. And is it a scheduled lab? Yeah, so it's shared with one other teacher. Both of us teach chemistry courses. Um, so we're always scheduling with each other <coughs> to use that space. And I think all of the chemistry teachers are sharing the space with their Yeah, any of the chemistry, I think we're sharing. Yeah, great. Yes, sir. Uh, Jim Vicario, the other Victor, I C A R I L. I think we've addressed you know the needs for individual classrooms, but more of space in terms of c communal use. Um, this building is inadequate for us to meet as a community. You look at us here, you know, having a small meeting. We have teachers standing outside the door. We can't even get people into a, a meeting room. Um, when we have faculty meetings, we meet in the course room. People have to sit on the floor because there's not enough space there. We don't have a place where uh, students can test for AP testing. They have to shut down the yes, library for right. two weeks. We don't have anywhere that we can bring special ed students. A lot of them have to leave the room for testing, um, for assessments to be read to. We don't have anywhere to take them. Uh, teachers don't have anywhere to go on their breaks. Uh, when they have prep periods, they have nowhere to go. They have to go in the library with other students, or they have to sit in the faculty room, which are inadequate. While teachers are having lunch, it's very hard to get work done. There's just not places where we can collaborate and do things together. All the goals that we've been talking about trying to do, uh, the building makes it very hard to accomplish those goals. Uh, as a group, as a whole school, we can't meet together as a, as a school because we don't have a space the way the gyms are divided. Our students, freshmen through senior, only get together, to, uh, together once an entire year when we have a pep rally outside in the stadium. I mean, how do you build a strong community when freshmen through seniors can't get together because there's not a room to do that? 
I mean, we just communal space is lacking. And then also, um, I just want to bring up outside of space is the uh, drop off for students I find to be highly inappropriate and dangerous. Mm -hmm. Trying to get down Route 10, um, coming to work is just a nightmare. Students get dropped off on the street. Um, students get dropped off um, where teachers are trying to pull in. Yes. I've seen a number of students almost get hit. We've seen car accidents. Try and get out of the schools. Uh, students or parents park in the fire lanes for extended periods of time. They park in the handicap space. Nobody is monitoring that. It's very hard to get out of the school. Um, and I know some of that has to do with just the infrastructure of Route 10, but I think if we widen our, our ability to get into the school, um, those lanes would be a lot easier for congestion getting in and out. So uh, those are just some of the major problems I see that affects everybody um, you know, that uses this building and it's part of it. That's very valuable. Thank yeah, you. I wasn't aware that uh, until this morning that there wasn't a space that the whole student body could come together in. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, if they can't fit an auditorium, which they usually can't because auditoriums usually aren't quite big enough, there's at least a gym that uh, has enough seating capacity. But... Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Virginia Knott, K-N-O-T-T, -T, and I'm a social studies teacher. Um, you know, I think we could all rattle off the multiple problems that we experience in our classrooms. Storage is a huge one. Um, and, you know, I don't teach science labs, but um, I still need some form of storage uh, in every single classroom. I think they can use it. Um, I have brown stuff that grows up under my tiles when the, in the humid months, uh, so beginning and end of the school year. Something grows from underneath the floor in many of our classrooms. Um, we're told it's glue, but I don't think that's the case. Um, my windows got replaced a couple of years ago, so that's exciting that I have new windows. However, they leak when they rain, when it rains. Um, there are you know, tremendous problems within the actual classrooms themselves and them not being large enough. But one of my biggest concerns that I think of quite frequently is the safety and the security of this building. Um, unfortunately, we're living in a time when schools are being targeted. Um, and we're not safe all the time. We built a security booth, which is wonderful, but we built it inside the building. Uh, so people have to come actually enter the building in order to be checked in. They're already in the building, you know, at that point. That is being taken care of. Yeah, really no, good. I understand, but um, there are schools that are being built, um, and I remember reading an article months ago that the entire design of the school was built so that the hallways and every teacher space and student space was designed to keep in mind that kids need, and faculty need to be kept safe uh, in case an intruder does enter the building. Um, so I think that's a huge primary concern as well. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, safety of everyone in the building is critically important to all of us. And unfortunately, because of what goes on in this world today, design of buildings has changed. Right. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up. And we, we have really tried to work really hard to deal with the issues that with the existing buildings and we've appropriated a lot of money for those man traps I think as they call them so you can get people into into that area where you can deal with them in a enclosed space before you know whether they're able to come in or not. Right. Uh, that's in process and every school is getting those but you know nonetheless I hear what you're saying yeah. it's critically important. That's what we design going forward we design to ensure that everyone is as safe as possible. And that's really sad that we have to design that way but it's a reality. Yeah. Can I piggyback on that? I know Matt you want to jump in but I'm um, sorry, Gina, G-I-N-A, Warburton, W-A-R-B-U-R, Tewin. Um, Dawn mentioned it earlier about the usage beyond us, and Virginia's talking about safety. Um, you know, we have the fingerprint scanners that um, we use to get in and out of the building, and you can see people's reactions. No matter what, our, our staff here is amazing, our custodial and our maintenance staff, they jump to fix anything we ask. They're killing themselves to fix all those things. But, um, you know, we believe we're secure, and some of us can't even get in to go to work. Uh, Mary now, I let her in the back door frequently. But on a weekend, um, you know, I, I could not get in my own building, the front door of my building. I could not. Um, use my fingerprint to get in the front door. I was with another staff member who also couldn't. Um, she was here doing something with students and I was here doing something with students. So I decided I was going to drive around the back of the building to try and get in my normal door. I park in the back. 
I thought maybe it was just I couldn't get in the front. As I was coming around the side of the building, there was another organization here using our space. I didn't need to get in the building. They had all the doors open. So here I was trying to get in the front of my place of employment with a group of students. I couldn't get in, and I, but I just had to travel around the corner of the building where an, another community group had doors open and propped. I walked right in and walked back up to the front and opened the door and let everybody in. I was locked out, but they were letting everyone in. I, I think that that goes with sort of the security and, and the safety of our buildings when other, even on the weekends, we don't know who's here, what's being used, and things like that. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, there's no question that those types of issues are important. I don't see going forward, even if we built a new school, we're still going to have these buildings being used by the community. That's part of what they're being built for. The question is, how do you manage the safety I think property? That's, I and think that's so, just the awareness exactly. of it. How do you, you know what I mean? How do you monitor? Right. Well, one of, one of the things that you'll do in a new school is you take those areas that are most used by the public and you put them together and you are able to lock off the rest of the building. Right. So if you allow someone into a gym, auditorium, area, or something like that, where they still don't have access to go wandering around the rest of the school. And I agree. I mean, this is, it, 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 people have to use those spaces. But it was comical that I couldn't get in. Yeah. But <laughs> they got probably, in somehow and had the doors wide. And, 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 and we're over all that. doing yes. what we're <laughs> waiting to get in. I drive by here, you know, all day and night, weekends, or there's always a bunch of cars in front. This building is extensively used. And, that, and that's a good thing, but it's also something we need to be concerned about. And I couldn't agree with you more, Rich. I mean, we need to design to be sure we can accommodate these extracurricular activities, but not burden the school system with safety issues and everything else. So I appreciate the comments. Thank you. Yes. Matt Swanson, Social Studies. What is the name? Swanson, S-W-A-N-S-O-N. Um, I want to kind of, I want to kind of piggyback on a couple of things that some people have said. Um, the brown spots on the floor are a huge concern. They've been there for years, and I feel like we get ignored every time we bring it up. It's not glue. I'm sorry, glue doesn't merge from the middle of a tile when it's humid and disappear when it's not. Um, since I started working here 13 years ago, I developed migraine headaches. Like I never had a headache before I walked in here, but I have them constantly now. And they get worse at certain times of year, particularly in the summer and the beginning of the school year when it's really humid. Um, I have a classroom with windows. The only way I can not have a headache is to have at least one window or more open every day of the year. My kids freeze. I can't turn on my heater because it makes it worse for my head. Um, and I basically have to tell the kids, bring a coat because it's going to be cold in here. Otherwise, I can't teach. Um, we talked about the tunnels, which have been supposedly fixed. I don't believe that for a second. The hatch in the center of the hallway over here, by my room, when that opens, we're supposedly not allowed to be in the building for our own health. To me, that says there's something wrong under there that is not being addressed. Just last week, we had to open the hatch on Monday because of the emergency in Dawn's room during school hours. Mary was great about telling me to get out of the area, but by Wednesday, I had a sinus infection. I've had sinus infections more than I can count. I've gotten so good at addressing, it's fight, knowing when I'm getting one that I don't even need to go to the doctor anymore to get medication. <coughs> um, they're perpetual. And the hatch opening is a trigger every time. So there is something under there that is making us sick. Um, Beth Rosenblatt, the previous chorus teacher, she was sick for years before she finally left here. Um, it's really concerning. It's a health issue. If you can't open a hatch when people are in the building, you probably shouldn't be opening the hatch at all. And I see maintenance people going down there with nothing on. I feel bad when Terry or any of them have to go near there because God knows what it is. And then we open the hatch during school and we don't even blow the air out of the building. There's doors right in front of it. Put a fan in front of it and blow the air out of here as fast as you can. Um, it's really concerning, and I'm sick of having headaches. Um, instructionally, in terms of the space, I have a relatively larger room, but it's cramped. I have um, tables in my classroom that I'm lucky to have. I can move them all around, 
but they're practically on top of each other no matter where I put them or how I put them. I have pretty much no storage for anything that want, I need to keep secure. Most of my people that I work with have filing cabinets that don't even lock. Yeah. I mean, they're locks. How do we not have locks? Um, I run Winterfest every winter. We have no place to put our stuff. We're squatting inside of a special ed closet <laughs> thanks to the special ed department. It's a disaster. I mean, this is a community event, and we can't even have the stuff that we need without traipsing all the way to the basement and begging someone to prevent us and lock the door. Um, the restrooms <coughs> have no ventilation. They have a lot of heat, though. They'll yeah. sweat. Yeah, they're hot. It's like a hot box. It's like going to the sauna when you go to the bathroom. Yeah, of course. Um, They've been broken for years. Yeah. yeah. One toilet's broken, the urinal's broken. No matter what it is, there's something broken at some time. Um, these are adult. Yeah, yeah. These are the doctors. The hand dryer, if you don't hold the button for this right number of seconds in the right angle, it's not going to stay on. I mean, it's unbelievable the fact that we work in a place that is literally falling apart around us and held together by tape and glue. So. Thank you. Yes? Uh, Amy Miliciano, B A L I S C I A. And I'm in the English department, and I just want to also echo what Matt is saying about the air quality in this building. I've been working here for 20 years, and from September to June, I do not feel well. And I did start to get migraines. I've never had one before. I started here, um, depending on what room I'm teaching in, uh, I get symptoms from something that's in that room. Um, as soon as I walk into Ian's office, the English office, um, I need a tissue, you know, right away. And it's, you know, we kind of joke about it, but um, it, it's a reality for a lot of us that um, by the end of the day and by the end of the week, um, we have a lot of these symptoms and we don't feel well. And um, personally, I can tell you that um, it, it's my every day. And thank God I love what I do because it's very hard sometimes to come into this building and not feel well. Um, and I, I just, I think, you know, even looking at some of the stains on the ceiling here, um, this is, uh, in many rooms, there is something in, in many rooms, and um, it's disheartening and scary, really, um, when you think about it. The kids don't feel it because they move. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in the same place all day. They're moving around, so I get headaches, and the kids think I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> not telling the truth, but I'm in that room all day. and. They're there for 55 minutes, and then they're going to their next place. So it's, you can't even, like parents, when I tell parents I get headaches, they don't get it because their kid has never told them they had a headache in there. Mm -hmm. Has there been uh, air quality testing done? I would imagine there has to be that. I don't know how recently, though. Yeah. I mean, obviously, what I'm hearing is concerning. And, and, but at the end of the day, I would really hope that when whoever's getting these concerns and we're dealing with it as best we can through air quality testing to make sure we can prove whether there's issues. I mean, if there, there's something with a hatchway, you can't remove it without removing everyone from the building. Clearly, we need to understand what the issues are and make sure that we, we deal with it as appropriately as we can. I mean, I don't think there's anybody in this community that's looking to put anyone's lives at risk. Um, you know, what and how we do school modernization is one thing. But, but having people in spaces that are not conducive to their health is not something anybody wants. So, you know, I'm, I'm very anxious to hear more as to how, even in the short run, uh, before we do school modernization, how can we help and assist any one of you that are dealing with some of these issues? I, I would have assumed they would be addressed. Uh, if they're not, I'd be more than happy to hear from people. So. And the part of the pilot I ran into in the oldest buildings is that they didn't have any kind of airflow. Yeah. Uh, newer buildings automatically turn over the air yeah. uh, every hour or whatever. Old buildings, they assume you open a window if you wanted an airflow, and that was it. Uh, so you've got that same stale air yeah, sitting in there all the time. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one issue, but I guess I'm trying to react to the fact that if you're being told it's glue that's coming up and it's really not, and it's something more devious than that, I'd like to know about it. I mean, but let's fix it. You know, clearly, air handling is a problem in all the buildings. As these buildings have aged, there's no question. What we hear over and over and over again is HVAC issues. I mean, climate control, all of that are really big issues. We get that. We understand that. Uh, and clearly, as we do school modernization, that's going to be a priority to fix. Uh, but in the short run, if there's health issues, because, you know, if you can't fix them, you can't fix them. But i, I got to believe health issues can be fixed. And I know we've taken big steps with the school system as 
particularly in those tunnels to remove water to make sure there aren't there isn't mold growing. Uh, I know that was an issue or a concern at one point, and I, I think they're monitored frequently to make sure that that system that's been put in place is working appropriately and they remediated what they needed to. But if there's more to be done, uh, I, I can assure you that people would like to address it. So, you know, again, I'm not looking to point any fingers at anybody other than the fact that I hate to hear from people that they're not feeling healthy in a space. So, you know, clearly we would like to address that. Um, my name is Rebecca Elliott. I'm in the special ed department. Um, I don't have my own classroom. I don't know that it's appropriate to have my own classroom, but we certainly need a lot more space in the special ed department. Um, you know, resource teachers on yeah. the classroom? Yeah, I also do testing. Um, we don't have the space adequate to fit the growing number of special education students that we see here. Um, and related to that, I feel like we should be a lot closer to the school counseling offices. I think that we work cohesively all day, every day, and we're constantly on the phone trying to catch people. I would love to just walk down the hall and say, hey, did you catch up with so-and-so today? He, I noticed he looked terrible in class. Um, also, our meetings. We're spending so much time walking back and forth to go to these meetings in these tiny conference rooms, which, by the way, should at least have enough room for 12 people. Um, because the little conference room that we try to house, it looks unprofessional and like... It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Um, so You're we just need space. That, I mean, we've been hearing yeah. that from, you know, more space like that. And we can collaborate closer. Yeah. yeah. And it, it does look bad. You know, you're looking, these parents who come in only once or twice a year, and they're in this little tiny room where you're all kind of just coughing on each other this season. Um, and it just feels like we could be doing so much more, you know. So the classroom space, space to test students when they need alternate setting, or sometimes in here in the library, and there's other kids learning, and it's not. And so then all those other kids, see, all oh, those kids are being tested in an alternate setting. Are they special ed? Is, mm -hmm. You know, so there's just, and our numbers are much bigger than they used to be. We're servicing kids who have all kinds of emotional needs. We need more space. Mm -hmm. And to work with school counseling directly <coughs> would be a really important thing. And that's, that's something that we need to communicate out to the public. Uh, some people look and they say, gee, your enrollment has gone down over the last decade. Uh, you should have lots of extra space. What they don't realize is that a lot of the programs that didn't exist 10, 20 years ago are now in our schools, take up a fair amount of space. And if you didn't have space, you'd have to be outplacing and spending an inordinate amount of money. Yes? Um, Leslie Pear, P A I E R, Pear, and I shared a little bit this morning about bringing our classroom spaces up to a 21st century. Um, learning environment to prepare or to work in school to prepare our kids for college what are you know what are they using um, what spaces are they um, working in in college and also to prepare them for the workforce um, so that was my, my big picture earlier this morning um, sorry I missed it by the way oh, that's, yeah. that's okay. Um, but uh, we have an video. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, they got it. They got it. Uh, it was just—it was a great conversation this morning. Thank you. Yeah, just a great conversation this morning with a lot of people adding, um, adding additional detail. Uh, but what I wanted to um, also share with you are more about the windows. So we have in my department, we have some of the new windows, and the problem with the new windows uh, in the business department is that. Uh, we have three computer labs, and they won't put in air conditioning units. So we've got to keep those rooms cool. Um, there's a, you know, with everything going on, and they, uh, and this is for many of our classrooms, so they put in the movable, what do they call them? Um, the portable. The portable, portable. The portable air conditioners. They don't work. Yeah, they're, they're blowing off. hot air. And you know, Michelle was mentioning that her classroom when she walks in in the morning. Sure, and this is. Sure, you buy a heater instead of air. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're like dryer hoses that are duct taped to your window. Right, they're about five, two, five two, two five-inch dryer hoses. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. takes yeah. some space. Ones, they are. Right? They are. What's what's that tape called? Duct the duct tape. tape. They are duct taped into one of the windows, the and then. What's that? With plywood. With, pl yeah. with plywood. Oh, you have a plywood or you have a nicer one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but my, my point is they're not effective. 
And I have on the other side of the business department the old windows. So I'm standing there today and the cold air is just coming in right through the cracks and the crevices that are you know, falling apart. You have black whatever on your hands. And those have the, um, the inserted, the older air conditioning units. And I want to say, don't put new windows in there because those window um, AC units work and cool down that classroom. So I, I don't know, you know what, what the plan is going forward, whether it's a new school or you know, we, we have more Band-Aids um, in trying to improve this building, but that somebody's got to think about that. And if they do put in new windows, then please think about the air conditioning units other than portable units um, so that you actually do cool down the classrooms. Does anybody have any other well, comments? Well, related to the windows, with I have the new windows that you're speaking of, and then they put in new blinds that don't actually oh, line the sun. Oh, right. <laughs> they don't blind the, They don't block the sun. No. So we have window blinds that the sun comes right through, and my, my kids are going like this, trying to see the sun. Are they old so blinds? No, they're brand new. You, you have the better blinds. Yeah, the yeah. ones. There's a brand new blind. Is that yeah. one? Yeah, inside the window. And yeah. the sun, I took pictures a couple years ago because I couldn't believe how bright my room yeah. still was. I mean, the sun is still all over the floor. Their kids literally it's shield squinting. their eyes to see the, I got my lights off, the blinds down, what else can I do, right? It's, and those are brand new. And if, Terry, do you want to? Oh. Terry Mornell, business department, and <coughs> N-E-A-U-L-T. I'm fortunate to have the brand new windows in the business computer lab that I'm in, but I have the first generation of the blinds, the new blinds, and there's nine of them. And in this day and age of lockdown drills and shelter in place, I have my students huddle in a corner, and then I have to spend many minutes bringing down the nine blinds, and they come down crooked, and then by the time I get the blinds down, the drill's over. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hi. Um, Kim Christensen, C H R I S T E N S E N. Um, I won't harp on the H V A C all that mm -hmm. I am one of the rooms that does have the mysterious growth of the tiles. Yeah. And most mostly in September. Yeah, yeah mostly it's in, still, in, in it's September. humid and it's warm. Um, it grows. And yeah, it, and I will say just to just to briefly touch on it, um, it does not grow between the tiles where the tiles meet one another, where the glue might come up it comes up in the middle of the tile and then it grows from there right. to 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 most of the room that's bizarre. what they have saying it's blue that's, what, they they that's, like it. that's what we've been told yeah for, for years simply yeah. You know yeah um but i will say uh one of the things that if we're looking at new you know new school new rooms would be multiple outlets in the rooms yes. with all the technology and the chromebooks and phones and chargers it's really important that they have outlets all over the wall so they're not like stringing their chargers and you're not tripping over them things like that outlets would be a good thing and different types of locks on our doors when we turn when we talk in terms of security our doors now are really old we're all in the hallway kind of jiggling the handle to see if the lock is out is it in is it really locked or in a lockdown because from the inside of our classrooms you can't actually tell if the door is locked it looks the same way but if we had some system where maybe it's like a little latch or a bolt on the inside of our classrooms to reassure us that things are locked, that would be very, very helpful. There should be some kind of an ultra safety mask. Right, just all of a sudden be able to shut it. You know you've got that door locked. Well, and I also think that's helpful when we have study hall monitors in our room, when you know foreign language teachers are in our rooms in and out, and not everybody has keys to every room that they're in in order to lock those doors. Most of us lock our doors and keep them locked, and in case of emergency, we're able to shut those. But that's not always the case. We're also locking every single kid who goes to the bathroom out when that happens. So in order to make that secure, even if you didn't have a key to that classroom, having a lock on the inside, you're able to shut it and lock it and be safe. Yeah. Yeah, I'm certain that new construction has some wonderful new ideas. I mean, the whole idea of lockdowns, as you know, it's really only the last few right. years. And Schools have been hustling and trying to come up with ways of dealing with it. My old school district, we had metal frames and metal doors, so they got little magnets that they put in. They kept the door locked, and if it was a lockdown, you pulled the magnet and the door closed and it locked. Oh, oh, 
then the fire marshal came in and said, you're not allowed to have little magnets to hold the door open. So there's all these conflicting issues that come up as they're exploring what the um, building here. Last, last statement, are you planning on also meeting with students in the building to hear their ideas? That wasn't a plan at this point. We're, we're, we've got scheduled meetings with each of the schools, which is eight or nine meetings. Okay. Um, I do think it's probably a good idea to organ maybe have an or organized meeting with some of the students who you know are in this building every day, walk through this building in June, come into this building to see what they do. It's sweltering, walk through the halls, these things on the ceilings grow. Yeah. Um, but maybe to have a conversation with the kids who, who walk the halls every day would be a good idea. Well, just little things, because I know people have talked about the backpacks in the classroom. So yeah. just as I was walking down the main hallway today, I looked and the lockers are about that yeah. wide. Yeah. And I said, well, nobody could ever fit a backpack. Right, there. others there are that big. big. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, if, if, if you're going to not want kids to be carrying backpacks all around, then you better give them lockers that are large enough that they can put some things in there. And time yeah. to stop at the lockers in between classes. Yeah, and you got a big building. You know, I understand that it's more convenient to have all this stuff with you, but you know, it's part of the problem if you've got. I joke with my kids that I want those preschool cubbies so they can <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. put their backpacks in there. Yeah. I yeah. know. Yes. Hi, Maureen Reed, REED assistant principal. And I just wanted to take a different angle um, in, in light of everything else being said, but that if we look at our state graduation requirements, which just recently changed, mm -hmm. they've specifically created a humanities and a STEM in terms of you know meeting requirements. And I think if we're looking at the best way to collaborate among our departments to help with that process of STEM and humanities would be to have the departments you know, within range of each other. Um, and I think that's really difficult to do in an older building in terms of getting those um, areas together. So that's kind of a philosophical where education's going point that I just wanted to bring up once everybody else had brought up all their very important points. So kind of to follow up on that, uh, I know you, all that stuff is available. It'd be really important to know if, you know, geez, something has changed so dramatically over the last four years since that report was done that we would redesign a building even four years later materially different than what they did back then. I'd be curious to see what's changed in just this four-year period, if anything. You might, you might say everything's great. a design discussion about the high school. Yeah. It was strictly the middle school. Yeah, building that and there was a price school, right? put on the high school. You know, the high school would come afterwards, and there was a dollar. You no, know, I get that, but, but, there was but, no but there's a lot of kind of similar things you're going to carry from school to school, whether it be classroom sizes. I mean, you may, you may not, maybe you don't. Maybe the high schools are completely different and there's nothing that is, that is the same in high school versus I just don't think, that, I don't think they were well, involved. Security alone in the past four years has right. probably changed drastically. Yeah, right. well, we know that, absolutely. So, um, I would say the size of the students are different than you're talking about in middle school class versus high school students. There's a lot of growth, particularly with the um, you know, boys as they grow, that they become larger. So that would need to be looked at. You know, the size, the middle school size chair is going to be different than a high school size chair. Um, also, we in science we have next generation science standards, which the model, um, you know, that has come out over the past couple of years, and so that I think should be evaluated. That, that's kind of what I was asking. Maybe I wasn't very clear in what I was trying to get at. But is there anything new that's transpired in the last few years? teaching-wise, curriculum-wise, that we would really want to take a particular look at that, you know, might have gotten missed last time because it wasn't around. Yeah, and yes, Thank you. Next generation science. I know in talking this morning, they were talking about a real focus on performance tasks in the class. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so you're doing many more real-life experiences. Um, you know, the model of standing in front of a classroom and giving them information is you know, whittling away, yeah. and there's a lot more group activity and uh, projects and things like that. Uh, I know they talked a lot this morning about storage. Yeah, um, I was going to add that because that's not something we particularly kids doing in the models science class. And having places to there's store so things, many so. materials, and that's probably true with the art department as well. Just the the materials that you need to teach, you know, all the different units you have. Yeah. So the art department talked this morning. The tech ed, the music department, they all brought up issues of storage and things like but that. But even in the, I, didn't, I don't know if I said before, I mean, I'm a special education teacher, but even in, we are historically, we have small classes because we're thought of as small group instructors. 
but our roles have changed and our groupings have changed. I share half an old half of an old biology room that sort of doesn't have a complete wall. The heater still runs from one end of the old biology room to the other. So you could hear everything between me and the chemistry room next door. But my room, I don't have storage. I don't have places to work on transition skills, employability skills, um, and that, I'm lucky in our department, I do have a room. There's only, we have rooms, but there's only three of us that have our own permanent rooms. Three? Three of us that have our own, and how many are in, in our department? 13. 13. And that area is growing quite a bit. Oh, yeah. it, yes, and our needs have changed as far as that stuff goes yeah. too. So storage space, space to work, people coming in to do employment tasks, all sorts of things. Yeah. Is there a room for physical therapy? It, it, we do currently have a physical therapy space that shares in a related service area. Um, ideally, it should have its own space. It does not, it is in, in a shared space. So even when the students are <coughs> receiving their um, PT or even their OT, um, they're sharing in an area where someone might be receiving speech services. So sometimes confidentiality can be an issue. So mm -hmm. that's some creative scheduling also. Okay. See, and that's the sort of thing you would have rooms specifically designed to do physical and occupational right. therapy mm -hmm. versus, you know, right. sticking them in with a speech person which who's doing something totally different. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, obviously, the asbestos abatements are an issue at the school. Um, and when you think of long term, you know, this the school is now supposed to be a shelter for the town. If there's a hurricane in the summer and we're supposed to have a long summer asbestos abatement, and the school's supposed to be a shelter for the town, yeah. not able to do that if the roof is leaking and there's something going on and everybody loses power in town because of a bad snowstorm and you can't put the people here, then the school can't be used as the shelter for the town. So aside from just academic things, this is a community service building for a lot of the community in town. And in those emergencies, it's supposed to be open for them. So structurally, it needs to be sound for them as well. One of the things the school modernization committee has to look at is if something is to be done with the high school, they have two choices. The state of Connecticut says you can renovate, but you have to do what's called renovate as new, meaning you've got to come in and you've got to do whatever that needs to be done so when you walk out the door, that school looks and feels like a new school or you build a new building. And so I think part of what you know the committee's got to do going forward is they're going to need to price out what would it take to renovate a school like this to make it like new, what would it take to build a brand new school, um, you know, so those are the kinds of decisions that the group's going to have to look at. And things like asbestos abatement, which is extremely expensive. And the reimbursement rates are different. Right. So you get more money for, re for renovation than you do for new construction. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the other very difficult piece of this is, listen, <laughs> this camp's been kicked so long, uh, it should have started eons ago. But the reality is, is now that we're dealing with it, how do you time this with every school? I mean, the reality is, is even if we start a project tomorrow, we were talking about this, even if we committed today to do a school, it's gonna take two years really before you get off the ground by the time you get everything done. And that's only one school. And then you're really dealing with everything else. So, you know, we've gotta be thoughtful of, okay, if, it, if they decide it's a six through eight that you need to start with, and that gets done first. I'm not saying it is, but if that's the decision, how do you deal with keeping you know you all comfortable as we can in the high school, do whatever repairs, renovations we need to to make everybody as comfortable as possible until the town can afford to do that next phase, which has been approved, which is dealing over the long haul with high school. So that's really a challenging piece because we just can't afford $500 million to do every school at once. I don't think anyone's ever done that. So that's really a challenging issue. And trying to figure out the logistics of this all, which school to lead with, what is most, most important, how can we gain efficiencies. The six to eight, I think, is, is, is crit critically important from an educator's perspective from what I'm hearing. Uh, and the question is then, once you get that done, it allows for some other consolidations throughout the system in some of our younger schools, you know, the younger kids, where maybe we can take a school or two offline, gain those efficiencies, have some real operating savings, that we then can pour into additional debt 
taking on additional debt to renovate the schools that are going to be here for a long haul. I'm confident a high school, a high school is going to be here for a long haul. So whether it's this building renovated as new or this building, you know, another building on this site or another site. Those are the challenging pieces and there's no easy answers, you know. Well, the last so, new building that was built in this town was in the 1970s. Yeah. It was Highland School. Yeah. And, um, you know, so things have been pushed off or additions and renovations done over the last, you know, 50 years. Um, you're not going to fix that in, in five. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. So, it's tough. So I think part of what the group has to do is to come up with a, a long-term plan that gets you doing renovations, additions, new building uh, over a period of time until we fully modernize the whole system. So we'll see. There have been no decisions made. Uh, it could be that at the end of this, the, the committee decides let's go ahead and do the high school first. And you know, uh, so we don't know yet. Um, all we're doing is gathering lots of information. And we really appreciate all the information you gave us. Let's take one last comment. And then you've, you've been wonderful to sit here until 320. Mm -hmm. um, it was just to piggyback off of something that Gina had said earlier. Um, I personally don't have the problem in my classroom, but most of the members of my social studies department do, and I'm sure around the school, is that some of these walls, though they might look like they're made out of cinder block or whatever, are paper thin. Um, and you can be having a test in one classroom, and then someone else in the next door is you know, playing a review game, and then there's cons I, there's teachers in my department that have to walk down the hallway and like, please quiet your class down because my class is testing. So um, I think it's just another point, and I don't know if I can even say this, but I really don't think this current building is even suitable to be reworked in the way that we're asking for it to be. Um, I just don't see how it could possibly be. Well, you've made a fairly strong case. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like to see some something very different in order yes. to meet yeah. the challenge of 21st century learning, that's for sure. But thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank we you. appreciate you coming out and spending all this time. And we're very, very in awe of what you do day to day. You know, you've done a great job. Uh, we hope we can help to get you the facilities to make your job a little bit easier. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.